next panel right away. And uh, let's bring on our moderator. And while that's happening, I want to get some activity. I want to see some activity in the comments section. Um, so throw in your aha moments, folks. And uh, we're going to pick a couple of uh, winners here in a minute or two. And um, so great participation. Mary, again, great to see you. You had an awesome session yesterday. Um, it's so good to see you and all the work that you have done for the Houston Cyber Summit as being part of captain, one of our, ca our captains for planning it and all the work that you have done with the Greater Houston Cyber Security Council and being a founding member of Cyber Houston. And we appreciate the support of the University of Houston and everything you do with the um, Texas CIO Council and the Cyber Security Council and the Cyber Security Initiative. Uh, you're all over the place and your support is <laughs> relative. Um, and I know that you have been joined with a fantastic panel uh, where you have um, uh, uh, Greg White joining and then you have, um, uh, I'm trying, trying to look it up really quick. <laughs> we have a fabulous panel, Umesh, and have, it's been uh, a lot of fun to be part of the whole Cyber Houston efforts. I think that this year's summit has proven to be truly outstanding, and I'm sure our attendees um, will second and third those thoughts as well. So I think we're in for another great session. Yeah, and I want to, uh, as I turn it over to you, I do want to kind of recognize uh, Dr. Greg White because he was instrumental in approving and encouraging and improving cyber, approving Cyber Houston as a Department of Homeland Security recognized ISIL. So with that, I want to turn it over to y'all and I'm sure you'll have a great panel discussion. Great. And Mary, at the end of your panel, get some people to... Um, uh, participate, because what we're going to do is I see some comments coming in, but I'm going to make them wait till after your panel during your Q&A to give that e-gift card for $25 to the Amazon gift card. And you all will get to pick pick the winner. Okay. Ooh, Over to fun. you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So one of the best parts of this panel is, as Umesh said, at the very end will be the audience participation part of the panel, in which case we're hoping that you're going to come up with some fabulous questions. The overall idea for this session is information sharing. And so we're going to start by talking about uh, the information sharing parts of this. One of the things that our previous panelist, uh, Glenn, mentioned is that to win this battle, you need to change the game. And so one of the ways that we change the game is we leverage expertise that we don't have. Um, in many of the earlier discussions, both yesterday and today, you would have heard um, pieces that tell you that um, we can't know everything there is to know about cyber. Cyber is so comprehensive and has so many different aspects to it. And so one of the ways that we gain access to information that we don't have is we network, we leverage each other. And that's one of the reasons that I'm sure many of you are participating in this summit um, yesterday, today, and tomorrow is so that you can get information that you didn't already have. And so one of the best ways we can do that is through an information sharing organization. So with that, I'm going to have our panel introduce themselves, tell you, who they are, what they do, and why they are part of this panel and the information they're going to briefly be sharing with you today. And so I'm going to start with um, Dr. Greg White, if you would like to go first, please. I'm uh, Dr. Greg White. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Texas at San Antonio. I'm also the director for the Center for Infrastructure Assurance and Security at UTSA. And one of the things, uh, the grants that we received in 2015 was from the Department of Homeland Security, which named us the Information Sharing and Analysis Organization Standards Office for the nation. So we're involved in uh, promoting information sharing and analysis organizations and writing the documents uh, to help uh, individuals and organizations form their own ISAFs. So I guess that's why I'm on the panel. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Glad to have you here. Now we have Daniel Hankins. Hello, everybody. Daniel Hankins. I am the State of Texas Cybersecurity Coordinator. And as part of that, I work with Mary and Dr. White on the Texas ISO, of which they both participate. Quick short intro. Go ahead. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Tahar, we're up to you. Hello. Uh, thank you for, thank you, Mary. Thank you, ISO. Thank you for Cyber Houston uh, for this opportunity to share on the panel with the great folks. My name is Tahar. 
Royal Martinez, you can call me T. And I'm the founder and CEO of Cyber Warfight of CEHT, which is Cyber Experts Highly Trusted. We are an IT staffing and cybersecurity solution firm, and we help companies protect and secure sensitive data. So let me share a little bit about myself and why I'm on the panel. I have two cybersecurity IT small businesses located in Texas, Georgia, and North Carolina. I have been in cybersecurity for a little over 27 years. I'm a retired Army communications officer, and I served 22 years protecting and securing our nation's highly classified data and infrastructures. Um, I am a founding member of the National Security Innovation Council, and one of those initiatives is to optimize the national security communities of practices across the great state of Texas. I bring to this panel passion, expertise, and experience as a cybersecurity and IT professional and entrepreneur. Great. Welcome, T. Thanks for being here. Yes. And last but certainly not least, we have Vic Malloy. Hello, everybody. Uh, just pleased as punch to be a part of this panel and uh, uh, what I am is a project manager at the University of Texas, San Antonio, as a part of the network of the Small Business Development Center Network in the Southwest border region. And want to commend the folks that there at U Houston, University of uh, Houston, who run the Small Business Development Center network, network there. Want to tip my hat to them. Uh, this is a collaborative partnership and we co-op together. We do not compete together, but we are very much synergistic. Uh, my background briefly is a, a retired military officer. Uh, I've worked in private sector uh, as a practitioner and as a manager and executive leader, cybersecurity. Glad to be here, part of the panel. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. So if, as our audience can see, we have an extremely distinguished panel, and I am quite honored to be able to kind of herd these cats in the right direction. So hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun over the next hour. You'll get some information. And like I said, remember to come up with your awesome questions, uh, put them in the chat so that you can be eligible for that wonderful gift card later. So let's start with... Um, Dr. White, could you kind of give us the big picture? You know, what is an ISAL and what do you see as being done with ISALs, not just within the U.S., but internationally as well? Sure, I'd be glad to uh, talk about that. Uh, first of all, what is an ISAL? An ISAL is, uh, the acronym, as the acronym implies, they're an information sharing and analysis organization. Uh, this includes the ISACs, which many people are much more familiar with. Uh, and ISAO is, at its most basic, an information sharing organization. Uh, they can be formal, they can be informal, they can uh, charge for membership, they might uh, offer membership for free, uh, they can be organized based on uh, specific sectors, um, or the membership can come from a geographic area, such as a state or a, a community, a city. Uh, but no matter how they are organized, the purpose of them all of them, whether it's a large uh, formal ISAC that's been around for 20 years or whether it's a new up and coming ISAO, uh, the purpose is to share information on cybersecurity issues, uh, incidents, events, and so forth. And, and, the, and the purpose is to then improve the cybersecurity of all the member members in that organization, in that ISAO. In terms of internationally, well, we all know that cybersecurity is not just an issue in the United States. It's an, it's an international issue as well. And so if sharing information is good within the United States, then sharing information with other nation, or organizations with other nations would probably also be very good. And, and it is true because an attack that may be occurring in the United States may also be occurring or may have occurred previously in another country. And it would have been nice to have heard about that, to share some information about that, because what we would love to do is to be able to prevent incidents instead of just always responding to them. Uh, one of the issues, it's a, it's a little bit trickier internationally, sharing information internationally oftentimes. That's why it's going a little bit slower than the, than the movement, if you will, is progressing here in the United States. You have issues such as uh, uh, privacy, uh, different laws that govern security and privacy in different countries. And so sharing of information can be a little bit tricky. Uh, where we're seeing it currently is you're seeing it in the various critical infrastructures. For example, the financial services sector. Uh, they are doing a pretty good job of sharing information internationally. Other sectors um, are, are attempting to uh, 
basically get up to the same level of sharing that the financial services folks are. But um, that's the current status of information sharing. Uh, we all desire it. We want to do it. Uh, but as I said, sometimes it's a little trickier doing it internationally. Excellent. Thank you for kind of setting our foundation for that. Now, Daniel, you're the Texas Cybersecurity Coordinator, so you're responsible for the state of Texas. How is Texas working this ISAL angle? What are we doing as a state to, to promote these ideas and to encourage this? In the last year, year and a half, we've actually set up our own ISAL with the help of Dr. White and Vic and yourself, of course. And it's actually free for anybody inside Texas. You can go ahead and register at isaw.texas.gov. And then we're also working with Dr. White and his staff to continue to promote establishing ISAs and information sharing within the community. Because we see it as a great benefit for everybody. The more information we get out there, the more secure all of Texas is. And we know that a lot of times it takes repeating and repeating and repeating for some things to sink in. So we figured the more ways we hit people with security information, the more ways they're going to absorb it. And a little tiny bit here and there raises the baseline for everybody. So I'm just going to do a really quick plug for something Dr. White is actually hosting October 27th for those community ISOs or people in communities that are interested. He's actually going to have a special topic meeting available for everybody on how to build up your community. So look for more information on that. Excellent. Hopefully our, our attendees are, are making a note of that because that would be an awesome opportunity. So one of the things I know that just as the University of Houston and as part of, of Cyber Houston, you know, we're all looking for ways that we can really leverage um, the benefit of being part of an ISAL. So let me go to, to T. So especially with your, your vast cybersecurity experience and, and your different companies and stuff, we know that the the threat landscape is continuing to increase and evolve in ways that, you know, at this moment we can't even begin to predict. So what do you see as the real value and the role that ISOs may play in helping to mitigate these threats? That's a great, great question, uh, Mary. So, okay, first of all, all cyber criminals are sharing their best practices with each other. And as they collaborate, it allows them to become more effective and efficient at stealing your data. So one of ISO's roles that is critically needed is to provide a platform to evolve and innovate quickly, best practices to address and stay ahead of some of these threats. Also, cyber uh, professionals must also share this information about cyber threats, as stated earlier, um, about incidents and staying ahead of these cyber criminals. The ISO's role uh, or platform allows companies from diverse industries to come together, collaborate, combat, and most importantly, defend against these cyber threats. This is especially important uh, for small businesses. I am a small business, have many small businesses, so I know personally, this is especially important for small businesses that find it challenging to analyze and share uh, information relating to cybersecurity um, risk and activities. Excellent. Thank you. So one of the things, T, that, that you just touched on that I know, you know, many of our attendees are small to medium sized businesses. And I know that there are several people among our attendees that are listening to this saying, well, that's just great, but I'm not a Fortune 500 company. I don't have the resources to ingest a lot of this intelligence information. Um, I personally don't have the expertise to deal with it. So, you know, this question to, to Vic, you know, you work with a lot of small to medium sized businesses. What do you see, you know, from the people that you are interacting with in the various industries that, you know, small to medium sized businesses cross? What do you see as the value that I, that they can gain from an ISAL? And more importantly, how do they engage with one? You know, I'm an island of one. How do I, I reach out to the masses? Can you speak to that? I'd be happy to. So first and foremost, it's always that old adage, you don't know what you don't know. And the first that tells you that they know everything, be on guard for that. But did you know that in 2021, it is forecasted that cyber crime damage is at $6 trillion. So in one way or another, each and every one of us has a vested interest and making sure that our organization, be they solo entrepreneur or be they a multinational uh, corporation, uh, takes on a proactive stance to understand your organization. And what are those measures that you have in place? 
And to Dr. Greg White's point, have you looked at the maturity of your organization? The cybersecurity maturity model community is, is a effort that Dr. Greg White has uh, initiated and been advocating and promoting uh, in a more effective way to let you know that, hey, look, while you may be serving uh, a homemade taco and that's the best homemade taco in the world, you won't be able to serve that homemade taco if you're a young high school student that is surfing the internet on the exact same network that you're doing your point of sales on is not segmented, not protected, and you haven't educated them and made them aware of the practices that they need to be put in place so that they protect the fact that tomorrow they have a job and they can come back in and operate on that work network and not become the victim of a ransomware. So there are two types of people, people that have been compromised and people who will be compromised. So when you think about the Equifax data breach, you think about all of these ongoing uh, uh, incidents that are happening on a global scale, everyone has to know that they have a shared responsibility. So part of that is you know, awareness. And that's why during National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, us doing this summit is so critical and important. So this is your first step as a small business owner is to say, look, I can't shrug this off. I can't ignore it. It is critical to me being in business that I have to protect my information, I have to protect my people and my technology so that I can stay in business. Absolutely. Now, I know, Dr. White, you know, one of the examples that you've given on on many occasions when I've heard you speak of this is the mariachi band. So uh, why don't you yes. share for, for our attendees that haven't had the, the benefit of hearing about the mariachi band? Um, that is one of the examples that you use to explain that anybody can, can benefit from a proper information sharing framework type thing. Would you like to elaborate on that and, and share with our viewers that haven't had that great opportunity yet? I would love to. I love this example. And, you know, uh, mariachi bands are very big, obviously, here in, in Texas, especially San Antonio. Uh, but I've given you, and used this example across the country when I talked about uh, the ice house. And I, I use it, just as, as was mentioned, uh, as an example to explain the, the question, the, the issue that uh, Vic was talking about. Um, you have to be some large entity. And you, the question you asked him about, uh, what, what if I'm just a, 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 a sector of one or an organization of one? And I say, that let's, let's consider the, the ISA or the, uh, the mariachi bands. Um, I would love to see, before I retire someday, a mariachi band ISA. That's my goal in life, uh, is to, to see that happen. And, and people you know, chuckle about that when I bring up mariachi bands. You know, why does a mariachi band need to have, uh, you know, mariachi bands need to have uh, a an ISAL and be sharing information. I said, oh, okay, well, let's talk about that for a second. Uh, do mariachi bands have a um, website? And the answer is, yeah, they do. Sure, they do. Uh, do uh, not all of them, but a lot of them do. You, um, the ones that are more active here in San Antonio certainly do. Uh, well, do mariachi bands ever collect things like credit card information? And is that information then stored on a computer, for example? or a cell phone or whatever. And the answer to that is also, of course, would a mariachi band, group of mariachi band um, benefit by coming together on some periodic basis, doesn't have to be weekly, doesn't have to be monthly, could be quarterly, whatever. Would they benefit by coming together and talking about, and here's the key, cybersecurity as it pertains to them. Do they need a 24 seven security operation center with uh, threat intel analysts? No, they probably can get away without having that. But would they would they benefit by coming together as a group and talking about well, what are you using to protect yourself from uh, from ransomware, or what are you doing with a, uh, for a host based firewall on your machine? How does this firewall thing work in Windows anyway? Would they benefit by coming together and talking about that? And the question or the answer is absolutely. And that's true of any small business, uh, true of any large business. You would benefit, you can benefit by coming together and sharing information. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And for our attendees, you've now heard the infamous mariachi band demonstration from Dr. White. So here's a question for all of our panelists. Um, 
clearly trust is important in information sharing. I don't want to share information with someone that I don't trust. And I'm not liable to take information from people that I don't trust and actually act on it. So within an ISAO, how do you establish trust between these different organizations so that they feel comfortable sharing with others, especially when this involves, you know, cross-sector collaborations. So, you know, I tend to know who in the higher education space I can trust and, you know, rely on for information. But once you start getting into other industries, other verticals and stuff, I may or may not have that same level of trust. So question for anyone on the panel, um, how do you attract, how do you establish this trust between these different organizations? As everybody here is aware, I work for a government organization. So people, when they look at me coming into their conferences and whatnot, like I'm here today, you can tell I'm not wearing a jacket and I've talked to everybody here before. But as a government employee, when I walk into organizations, people kind of become a little bit mistrustful. They're afraid that I'm coming in to either take over or mandate new things. And it's building those personal relationships. Vic, for example, realizes when I pick up my phone and call Vic that I'm not going to mandate something to Vic. I'm just looking for some kind of information and he's free to share it or not, it's up to him. But now that we've built that personal relationship, I also know that when Vic calls me roughly what he's going to ask about and then he's going to put me in contact with other people. Same thing with Dr. White. I was emailing him this morning looking for a contact and because we've worked together so much now, Dr. White is comfortable giving me these contacts and he'll make those introductions for me and that builds up that trust level. It's, yeah, like I said, really personal relationships. I, I, I'd definitely like to add to that. Um, coming from so many years of service and for me, uh, when you have leaders that set the culture like Dr. White, that sets the tone and the atmosphere that drives a platform and the community of trust um, as, as a business, you have an understanding and, and some others may even have an a, 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 a oath that says, we're coming with these intentions. And when that culture is set with ISO says, here is the intentions, are uh, you stakeholders are in agreement with these intentions, this culture of trust and parent transparency for the higher good of our nation's security. For that, um, I don't know anyone in this space who know it's, it's a space of selfless service, whether you're doing it for profit or nonprofit or government, um, we're all in. And that's what leads that it starts to build that bridge of no like and trust factor. But to what uh, was just mentioned, it starts with, um, I, I, I see Dr. White, there is a veteran um, uh, uh, cohort that's there, the same thing with Vic. And, and so that fosters that as well, that no like and trust factor. Absolutely. Thank you. That's a great perspective. I want to take just a minute, and, and Dr. White, we'll get back to you in just a minute, but we have had uh, Steve Brown join us, um, another one of our illustrious panel members. I believe there were some technical difficulties earlier, so Steve, we're very pleased that you're able to join us. Why don't, for the benefit of our attendees, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're bringing to the panel? I apologize to my fellow panelists. Um, I had a little bit of technical difficulties right before. Uh, I'm Steve Brown. I'm a senior consultant with Reprivita. I've been around the space for a few years and recently retired as the chief security officer of XL Energy. Great. Well, we are very pleased that you were able to Thank overcome you. the technical challenges that we've all had, and, and we're glad that you're here. One of the questions, Steve, that, that we're working on right now is how to build trust within an information uh, sharing organization, especially among um, industries with different verticals and, and different uh sizes and all kinds of different characteristics. And I think, Dr. White, you were going to add something to what, what T had already commented on. Uh, yes, thank you. And and I wholeheartedly agree with what she said. Uh, one of the things about trust is it generally it takes some time. And if you take a look at the ISACs, the, you know, the, some of those like the financial services ISAC has been around for more than two decades. And in the early days of the financial services ISAC, which is once again, ISACs are information sharing and analysis organizations. Uh, they, in the early days, the banks weren't freely sharing information. It took time before there was a this culture of sharing that was established and what it took was basically this is just uh, basically uh, adding on to something that t said it it takes a, a group of individuals coming together to recognize that when it comes to 
Cybersecurity, we are not competitors, we are partners. Uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, Bank of America and Wells Fargo are not competing. They are partners against the cyber attackers out there. And when a sector or a community understands that, then you can really start seeing information sharing take, uh, take place. And one of the things that we think is the sweet spot really for establishing trust are those community ISACs because it's often, oftentimes it's a lot easier to establish trust when I, once a quarter, once a, a month, whatever it may be, I come together and I meet people and I talk to them and we talk about our kids or schools or whatever's going on in the community. You can, you can establish trust a lot quicker uh, with that personal contact oftentimes than in the, you know, the internet world. Unfortunately, we don't get a lot of personal contact even in the local community anymore, but assuming COVID-19 eventually goes away or, or gets handled, um, maybe we'll start meet, meeting again at some point. And that's why we really think that those community state, those geographic, the geographically based ice house are really the sweet spots for the future of ice house. So we're already kind of there with the Cyber Houston ISAL because it is a community-based ISAL. So good to know that we're on the right track. So, so Steve, I know that in your role, you see a lot of things throughout the country. And one of the things I would imagine is you see ISALs take different forms um, in the different industries and stuff like that. So would you like to, to share with the group what your perspective is on, on ISALs and what you've seen and kind of give us a, a different view from, from what we've already talked about? We saw that when I was with Wells Fargo uh, in 2012, when we were subject of the um, Iranian uh, DDoS attacks. Every morning at eight o'clock, you know, we'd get the email and one of the banks would be picked. And it just so happened, most of the CISOs and uh, senior personnel were to get, of all the big major banks were together when it first happened. So we immediately began sharing intelligence back and forth, what worked, what didn't. We got to the point where we were calling smaller banks up the next day and saying, hey, this is going to happen it, to you. This what is what works, this is what doesn't. And we were very open, very collaborative. I think, you know, Steve's point is, is a really good one that, you know, one of the things is leveraging the pain that other people have had so that you don't experience that same pain. And certainly, you know, kind of giving the, the proactive warning to, to others as to how they, they can combat some of that. So I think uh, Steve made a very good point there, too. It takes entities not being ashamed when something happens to them to share that because so many entities, they want to keep that inside and they don't want to tell anybody that something went wrong. But you have to share that information out so that it doesn't happen to other people and then realize that your trusted partners aren't going to use that against you. In fact, they're going to come back and they're going to start sharing their That's a great point, Dan. So does anyone else have a, another success story that they'd like to share as to, you know, an experience they had and how an ISAO or an ISAC helped, you know, share that information and make things better? Well, I, I like to share, if, if I may, Mary, the other side of that coin, um, just as humans and as business, I can tell you the greatest lessons I've learned was not in my success, but in my failures. And so if I could just share a quick story um, of, a, of a real situation, um, we had a potential client um, that in our discovery process, we shared with them that ISO was a critical uh, resource to protect their business. While they did not become a client of ours, we discovered later that they did not take action and all, they did not take any action on the information and guidance we shared. Unfortunately, far too many companies put cybersecurity investments as a low priority and, and rarely allocate a budget to cyber protection. Um, in the case of our potential customer, uh, without implementing uh, ISO, as one of the tools we recommended, they became a victim of ransomware. They were locked out of their systems. Uh, they were locked out of their sensitive data and they had to pay a significant amount of money in just hopes to get their data back. And when data is breached, there is a financial and illegal cost to data breaches. Unfortunately, too many companies ignore their cyber risk or they think, as Vic said and everyone on the panel, it will not happen to them. Companies like CEHT and others represented on these panels are resources to, to include ISO to save companies time, money, and most important, brand reputation. Absolutely. So that's the flip side 
instead of a success, there was a great lesson in that failure. Absolutely. Go ahead, Dr. White. Sorry, I apologize. If I could add to that, uh, lessons learned because of failures. Uh, in the early, you know, the, another one of the very robust ISACs currently is the multi state ISAC. I think every, every state territory is part of the ISAC, number of communities as well. They, they're tremendous, they send out lots of information. But in the early days of ISAC, there was, they were having a meeting one, day, one time where a state was talking about uh, an incident that had occurred in their state with state government and, and being targeted. And another state came, basically popped up and said, oh yeah, we had that happen to us. <laughs> and it was like, why didn't you say something? You know, then we, and, and I'm not naming the states, you know, the one state, it was, they could have avoided it potentially and could have, could have you know, uh, headed it off at the pass if the other state had that it got hit first had mentioned it. And it was a lesson to everybody that was on that call that no, we do need to, to share information. So I'll give another example kind of along those same lines, but but one that many people can potentially relate to. And it has to do with emergency management. And we were going through a tabletop exercise related to a cybersecurity exam um, incident. And one of the things that was brought up was if this was a hurricane, you would have a very different perspective about it because we accept the fact that meteorologists are taking guesses. They don't know where the storm is going to go. And when the storm doesn't go in the direction that they, they had thought it would, and yet the emergency managers have done you know their due diligence and they have their plans and stuff like that, when it does hit an, a part of the country or an area that wasn't as fully prepared as they could have been, they all come online saying, you know, we did the best that we could did the appropriate things in place and you know, no one can control a storm but with cyber which we really can't control either we do the same types of due diligence but nobody wants to step up and say yep yeah, we got hit we you know we weren't as prepared as we could have been we thought we were but we weren't but but the reality is is that's why we've been together and that's why even when you look at hurricane tracking and stuff like that it's not one meteorologist that's making a best guess as to where it's going to go. They have lots of computer models. They have lots of experts that they talk to. But more importantly, cities talk to each other. They talk to their, their local governments. They also talk at the state level as well. If this happens, here are all the things that we can do to help each other get through it. Um, we need to do, take the same approach with respect to cyber in the sense that we all need to work together. We need to share the information that we have. No one cybersecurity expert is going to be correct, but maybe all of us together will come closer, much in the same way that the meteorologists together will come closest to predicting you know, where the, the next major storm, hopefully there won't be yet another one this year, uh, will go. Vic, I saw you nodding your head for, for a lot of these comments. Do you have a perspective that you'd like to share about successful ISAL sharing or an example of a failure? Uh, what I would share, and, and those are all great examples, but I, what I would share is uh, it was posted earlier by Andres about the InfraGuard organization. Uh, so law enforcement has come up and they stepped up to the plate to you know, provide open source information that's readily available to the average consumer that they can begin to take action on advisories and informations and updates. As a matter of fact, this morning, I took a look at my iPad and, and did a, a status check on my software update to make sure that uh, my update. So if you have an iPad, there's an update. You need to make sure you got the update done. But that's what it's about. It's about information sharing and resources. So another resource that I'll go ahead and plug for Dr. Greg White is the culture of security. So they have created a age appropriate K through 12 program that promotes if you're a toddler and you pick up your i your dad's iPad or your mom's iPhone or Android device, or whatever, and you're playing a game, we want to make sure that we start with that safety, you know, as soon as they can pick up a device and become, you know, interactive with that device to do it safely, securely, and smartly. And then go all the way to college and beyond K through gray to make sure that we are sharing information in an informative and, and education, uh, uh, in, uh, interactive way so that it's not foreign to how they operate and use technology. So it's imperative as us as information security professionals to start the ISAO at home. So, you know, have that conversation with your spouse or significant other and saying, you know, you know what, what things are you doing and, and are you aware of these vulnerabilities that are in the world today. And, 
and, and are you protecting yourself and staying abreast of uh, how to keep your software and your application and your devices secure, monitoring what's going on there on their social media feeds and making sure that they aren't, you know, becoming victim to uh, nefarious activities that resolve, resolve there. So it doesn't have to be a formal organization. You can start at home, you know, with your significant other or even just your, your youngest. Uh, uh, I'm kind of glad you brought up the at home thing. I have three kids, well, two at home now, one's over by Mary, actually. But um, they're my kids, so they side hand hear about information security all the time. Of course, you know, my kids don't exactly want to do what I do when they grew up, but it is what it is. And of course, dad talks and it's in one ear out the other most of the time. But they listened a little bit about the online security at home. And if you Google any of their names, you're not going to find anything. They all have all their accounts, fake names. There's no pictures of them or anything. And they consciously made that choice themselves. But it really didn't sink in for one of them until one of their friends posted a picture of somebody partying. And then the university that they had just gotten into called the next day and they were no longer a member of that university. And the look on all three of my kids' faces was just like, dad was right. And I was just like, that's great. You became instantly so, a, a brilliant yeah. person, right? Yeah. I'm sorry for that girl that had her picture taken, but you know, it's great that it just sunk in right there. Well, and I think that's a good point that both, both you and Vic make. You know, our families are, in fact, a information sharing organization, whether we, we like it or not. And I know that, you know, we were using the example of kids and, you know, in, in my family, they will probably be more competent than I am if they're not already on, on technology stuff. But it also works upward. So our parents, our, our aunts, our uncles um, who might not have, you know, grown up with technology in the way that many of us did are now, you know, the flip side to that. So sharing, you know, in that direction as well. So I would like it to be very important for everybody that has been participating so far to try to stump our panel with an awesome question. The better the question, the better your chance for, for one of those awesome gift cards that Umesh has been giving away. So as you know, we have quite a bit of expertise across all of our panelists. Um, so no matter your question, big or small, it will be good, I'm sure. So please post your question in the comments. And so we can hopefully get some, some great discussions from our, our panelists. So while we're waiting for some questions, I would like to pose a public service announcement that the uh, Small Business Development Center from UTSA is hosting two town halls in the month of November. And we've invited Dr. Greg White and Daniel Hankins to be a member to talk about cybersecurity in a time of COVID. So we've invited our Chamber President Rich Perez to be uh, a, a, uh, a lead speaker on the 1st, but that will be on the 5th of November. And then on the 17th of November, we've invited Congressman Will Hurd uh, to be the key speaker and, and feature speaker on that day. And once again, it's just another opportunity to where we can share information you know, in a town hall virtual setting uh, with our community. And we've been doing that since the uh, the outbreak of this pandemic to make sure that much like what's going on there at, at Houston in your small business development center network and letting the, the small businesses know about the PPP and the, the, the paycheck protection program and the loans that are being available to them and, and the idle uh, resources that are out there. We just wanna make sure that uh, we promote information sharing, resource sharing, and because to the degree that we, we educate one, we educate many. And so uh, just wanted to uh, promote that. And thanks to Dr. Greg White and Dan for uh, volunteering their expertise to be a part of those two town halls. So that is an awesome uh, opportunity for those of you that have been you know, very much intrigued by our panel, which I certainly have been, uh, Encore presentations already on your calendar. So make sure that you are, are setting up those dates. We have the special topic meeting uh, that will be on October 27th. We have the two dates in November that Vic just uh, mentioned. Uh, I'm sure that we will make sure that all of that gets posted on the Cyber Houston site so that everyone has access to write that down if you haven't already. But great opportunities for, for encore performances. 
Um, so just as a, a programming note, uh, one of the issues that Steve is having that none of us here in Texas can directly relate to is that they've received nine inches of snow in uh, in his location, which is part of the reason that uh, there are some network issues there. So uh, unfortunately, we cannot totally relate to that here in Houston. Um, however, it is 2020, so it could be a blizzard tomorrow. We, we never know. Uh, so we will send warm thoughts along with great internet connectivity thoughts to, to Steve as, as we work through this. So questions. Do we have some great questions? So while we wait for more questions, yes, it is a cybersecurity risk. Absolutely. I, I think to, to add a different spin to the concept of um, the ISO is if any of us is part of an HOA, and if it resonates with you, if you know nothing about IT, everyone in some form or fashion have dealt with an HOA or co-op. And so the concept is a foundational idea of neighborhood watch. And if people can, if that can resonate with them to keep crime down, if you look at cyber and the concept or a foundational idea of neighborhood watch, it won't be the boogeyman. Cyber is this boogeyman thing underneath the table or the bed. We won't say three times in the mirror. It's Halloween coming up. And so <laughs> just to make it something more relatable, uh, it, maybe that'll help people resonate. What is this ISO thing? What is this boogeyman? What is this cyber criminal? What does they look like? It kind of brings some teeth to it. I know here in Texas, we had a rash of credit card scammers at the gas pumps yes. for a while there. And that was all over my neighborhood social media. And most people just didn't equate that to cybersecurity, but gas pumps are miniature Skimmers. computers. And yeah, yes. it's cybersecurity. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then having those controls, uh, one of the vendors, American Express, they had some protections around those skimmers where it was uh, uh, reimbursed through you, through whoever financial banking insurance on the backside. So that's a great point. Um, those old um strategies being a certified ethical hacker myself we think like criminals and so um believe it or not even dos attacks today are relevant in certain infrastructure environments that i won't mention so um they stay innovative and they reinvent like the kids do uh clothes they reinvent and bring back uh old uh retro <laughs> approaches by the way, uh, I think the cyber equivalent of that boogeyman in the mirror is you don't want to stand in front of your mirror and say ransomware yes. three times. Yes, there we go. <laughs> Excellent point, especially if you're a variety band. <laughs> so, I heard, so I heard a horror story the other day. Somebody was on vacation down in Mexico and got a phone call that they had just been hit with a ransomware attack. That is the longest distance traveled that we know of to respond to something. Wow. Yeah, so, that's not how I'd want to end my vacation. So we do have a question. Um, so Nextdoor is an app that many people are using for informal information sharing among their, their local community. So the question is, how secure do we think the Nextdoor app is? Um, it is not. I encourage everyone on your phone to get a, a VPN. There are some that are free and some you pay for. Um, when doing anything mobile, install a VPN and an antivirus at a minimum on every mobile device tablet. Good advice. I'm big on the don't share your personal information if you don't have to. And I know when I registered for Nextdoor, I had to give my address, but there's eight house numbers between where I live and the neighbor next door. So I kind of made up one in between. So nobody <laughs> quite knows where I live. So because we've seen large social networks been breached and then all that personal information is lost. And the more information you give them and make available, the more information you're potentially losing. And then once it's out there, it's out there. Uh, well, and I think that's a very good point in that just because someone asks you for information doesn't mean, number one, you have to give it to them. And number two, you don't necessarily have to give totally accurate information to them. So when someone asks you, you know, what's your dog's name, you could e either give them a different dog's name or 
I don't even have a dog. Why do you think I have a dog? You know, so those are the types of things that um, I know a lot of people feel compelled to. Well, they ask me, I have to tell them, I have to tell them the truth. Not necessarily. So make sure that unless it is a government agency, if a government agency is asking you a question, you probably do legally have to give them the accurate answer. Um, but for social media purposes, um, keep in mind that you don't necessarily have to represent yourself the way you actually are. I'm sure on social media, the vast majority of people are born on January 1st. <laughs> <laughs> Me. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert and a concern, real world. Um, that information like next door, uh, a, a large, of our, a large uh, population of our customers are receiving an email threatening about voting. And so in that email, it's stating, this is where you live. If you don't vote this way or that way, um, we will come and get you. This is all, this is not anything US sourced. I can share that. So that's why it's critical to, to your point, fudge the numbers of where you live, pick a different city. Um, but that's happening real world today, as of in two Texas, hours yeah. ago. And Texas, the only information about your voting is that you went and voted. Exactly. Who you voted for or anything like that is not public records. So exactly. Email such as that, right into the trash folder. Exactly, and report it, so yes. Yeah. So one of the questions that has come back up in the chat has to do with what we were discussing earlier, which is building trust between organizations. So a quick thing from, from each panelist, maybe what would be one thing that you would suggest um, someone that's interested in joining an ISAL do to build that, to help to build that trust within the, the ISAL? One of the things I know that was discussed earlier is perhaps occasionally have some type of either face-to-face -face or video type meeting so we can see the people that we're trying to build these trusts with. Any other helpful hints that y'all can think of to help build that trust? Join events like what uh, Vic just mentioned and Dr. White. Go to events, conference, even though they're virtual, and just show up um, so you can build that no like, and trust factor. Show up. And on the final... And I think it's also important... Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 go go ahead. Ahead. I think it's also very important to be unafraid to open the kimono. Be the first to share the information, share the vulnerabilities, share what's happened. If you're the first, it, often people feel obliged to reciprocate and it builds trust that way. Excellent point, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, and stick around. I mean, you need somebody who's going to go ahead and champion that. If you just, hey, I'm going to start sharing cybersecurity information, but then you sit back and you wait for everybody else to do it, it's never really going to get done because everybody else always waits for somebody to step up and take the initiative. So. You really want to start sharing information. It really has to be you sharing that information. And, and I think the, one of the part of the question was the the I believe it's a cross sector aspect of it. I may be able to, I may have a certain amount of trust in the people within my own ISAO, but what about my ISAO sharing information with other ISAOs? And and what that basically boils down to is, you know, you first have to have trust with your ISAO and trust that your ISAO is not going to do something with your information in sharing it with another ISAO that you would not want. And so that you basically, um, you know, you, you build the, the, the silos and let the silos start communicating with each other as those silos have, a, have a proven that they are trustworthy. You know, and I think that's a very good point. And I think something that tends to get lost on, on technology people is a lot of this is the human factor. And so think about why you would trust someone that you would meet on the street. You know, you would trust them because, hey, I'm talking to Vic and Vic had good things to say about this person. Or, well, you know, I've read a lot of stuff and this person has some pretty good quotes that they've you know listed different places. Or I know that they've already shown up to these meetings and contributed to different things. Those are the things that would make you normally trust someone, not necessarily just in a technology world. So bring that into our technology world and kind of use that same methodology to how would you, you know, seek to trust someone in general? And I think those are all good points. So I think that we are starting to, to run close on time. So before we are actually out of time, what I'd like to do, um, for those of you at home, you know, I am just incredibly honored to, to be sitting with all of these people. And over the course of, of the hour, I've heard some really, really great things. But 
I'm going to give you like the Cliff Notes version. And for those of you that don't even know what Cliff Notes is, the Twitter version of this, in that I'm going to ask each panelist to give us what's your one big takeaway from this discussion, from what your experience with ISALs have been. If people walk away from this session and can only remember one thing, what would be that one thing that you feel was, was most valuable? So I'm going to start, uh, Vic, I'm going to start reverse order with you. It's an old adage, but I believe it's very true. If you're gonna walk through a minefield, walk in the footsteps of someone else. It's not good to try to have to have the experience to know that, hey, this is explosive. And we've been talking and sounding the alarm uh, as information security professionals for years and decades that the next incident will could be you know, even more detrimental. And we've already had in the last 30 days an incident to where a cybersecurity um, incident caused the death of someone being redirected to the wrong hospital, and that patient died en route. Uh, we we know that it's it's real, and now that it's taken a life, hopefully it won't take that for you to, you know, step on a landmine to know that hey, it's dangerous. Excellent point. Thank you, Vic. T, we're up to you. It it is the financial responsibility of any and every company that has sensitive data to protect and secure that data, bottom line. Excellent, thank you. Daniel. I'm going to do a little tiny bit of salesmanship and share my information out. So anybody who's listening, go to isao.texas, spelled out .gov, and sign up for our mailing list. And we're gonna share information with you absolutely free go ahead. And hopefully that builds up your trust with me. And then you can start sharing information back to me. Very cool. All right. So Dr. White, here's your chance. What do you want the world to know? Okay. I try to, you know, as a professor, I normally speak in 50 minute increments. So I don't know if this is going to be hard there. Well, imagine uh, I kicked you out before then. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, bottom line, everybody can be and should be a member of at some level of an ISAO. And if, if you need to start with a community, I think a community ISAO is a great way to start. And if you need help uh, with forming that ISAO, we um, have an, an organization set up. I'm going to give you the, the uh, website you can, you can go to and contact us. And we're here to help communities set up their own ISAOs. And that's the C I A S I S A O, all one word, dot org. So C I A S I S A O dot org. Excellent. Hopefully everyone is writing that down. Um, if not, I'm sure that we will have that tagged um, shortly so that everyone can, can, all of our attendees can see it. Um, this has been a fabulous panel. I know I have learned a lot. Um, as I kind of gave as part of the introduction, what I see the value of the ISO is the opportunity to learn from people that have far more expertise than I do. Um, cyber is wide open and certainly no one can have, you know, all of the knowledge. And I know that getting back to one of, I think, Vic's earlier comments, you don't know what you don't know. I know a lot that I don't know. Um, it, I'm sure only scratches the surface. So. Discussions such as this and learning from, from experts such as y'all is extremely valuable and any opportunity to leverage that through ongoing associations with ISALs, um, I'm sure will be beneficial to, to most of our audience. So thank you all extremely much for giving up what I'm sure is very precious limited free time um, to, to share with our, our Cyber Houston audience, all, all of your expertise. Um, we've enjoyed this, I've enjoyed this. Um, so Umesh, uh, I think that we are, are wrapping up our, our panel. I'm not sure what next steps are as far as rewarding some of our attendees uh, with the coveted gift card, um, but I'm sure you will step in and, and tell us shortly. But my personal thanks to, to our panel, um, to Vic, T, uh, Dr. White, Daniel, Steve, Challenge technology-wise, we're, we're certainly thrilled that you were able to participate, uh, even with all the snow. So thank you all very much for your time.